American fighter pilots found it extremely difficult to distinguish between friend and foe in the jungles and rice paddies of Vietnam. To cut through the fog of war, hundreds of facts scoured the countryside in lightweight, unarmed aircraft, pinpointing enemy positions with target marking rockets and directing follow on airstrikes. The facts never attracted as much attention as the pilots of fast and powerful fighter bombers. But much of the massive air war in Southeast Asia would have been impossible without their daring support. Few air combat missions could be as dangerous, demanding, and potentially heartbreaking as the missions of forward air controllers in Vietnam. The ability of fighter-bomber crews to independently provide close air support proved to be extremely difficult. Firefights often broke out at close range between small American patrols that became intermingled with the elusive Viet Cong beneath dense, triple canopy jungle. The FAC's mission was to quickly make sense of the situation from above and to call in airstrikes in support of the men below, a job he had to do with nothing more than a few radios, a few target-marking rockets, and a lot of guts. I can only describe it as, as sheer chaos. And it usually, the forward air controller got called when everything was going, was going steadily downhill. And the Army would try and control what they're doing with their command and control helicopters, and then when they get into it and they just find out, oh, there's too much in here, we need a heavier firepower, they can't handle it with the gunships, they can't handle it with artillery, or they just can't find the friendlies. That was the biggest problem was in the jungle, under the jungles. Nobody knew where anybody was. Remember, we, we didn't have uh, satellites and, and GPS, global positioning systems, or anything like that. You know, this was technology. This was reading a map and locating somebody on the map. And the maps were old. Uh, a lot of the maps we used were from the French. The pressure was enormous. Time was of the essence. But every decision a fact made could have meant the difference between life and death for men on the ground. The experience of the fighter bomber crews the capabilities of their aircraft and ordnance, and the exact positions of friendlies were just a few of the factors that had to be considered before a strike could be called in. To make matters worse, facts often had to immediately weigh the risk of over-responding to frantic calls for help against the risk of losing men because of their own inaction. Sometimes they wouldn't tell you how close it was. They would just say, bomb the target because they were in such dire straits that they needed air support and they needed it now. So you would ask them, you know, how close is this to you? They would say, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. Just put the bombs down. Fax performed several critical missions in Vietnam, but none were more important to the pilots than close air support. Many not only knew the troops they supported, they actually became close friends with them. The bonds formed with members of U.S. Special Forces teams were especially intense. Facts assigned to these elite units lived with and regularly assisted the same small reconnaissance patrols day after day. John Flanagan fact for Project Delta, a unit that routinely inserted small teams into extremely hostile areas to spy on enemy activity. I knew them all by first name. I could recognize them. It's their voices over the radio. You know, I know who they were. Although we used, you know, official call signs, but I, you know, I had a beer with this guy. I knew his wife. I knew his children. I knew his girlfriend. I knew, you know, everything where he was from. So it became a very, very personal uh, type of war. Facts were terrified of losing the men they were assigned to support. They had a front row seat above the action and would do everything in their power to prevent such a haunting scenario. 
but their unique role routinely propelled them straight to the heart of some of the worst situations imaginable. No one is more aware of this fact than John Flanagan. On December 2nd, 1966, he was called out to assist a last ditch effort to recover a Delta team that had accidentally been inserted into Laos. No fighter support was available, but when Flanagan finally pinpointed the team's position, the situation appeared secure enough for one of Delta's helicopters to attempt a rapid pickup. The North Vietnamese, they waited well-disciplined troops. They waited until the helicopter just got into the hover, and they opened up. And it was an ambush. They had sucked the helicopter in an ambush, and they started transmitting on the radio. We're taking fire, we're taking fire. And I could hear the slugs from the AK-47. I could hear them hitting the helicopter. You could hear them going through the metal. And then you hear the uh, door gunners with their M60 machine guns firing back, hammering back. And I got on the radio, and I said, get out of there, get out of there. Such desperate situations drove Flanagan and many other facts to risk everything. They knew they were the lifeline, the last ray of hope for panic-stricken men on the ground. But so did the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese. And when it became clear that the pilots of these strange little planes were much more than just casual observers, the slow-flying facts became a prime target. Pilots took every precaution they could to survive. Most routinely radioed ground units with the hope that if they were shot down, someone would be able to reach them before it was too late. Others packed a small arsenal of weapons just in case they had to shoot their way out. But these measures ultimately did little to reduce the dismal loss rates that facts suffered in Vietnam. Typically, um, either went out and were never heard from again, or went out and got hit and went down, and we knew where they went down, but it was such a hot area, by the time we got there, uh, they were dead. People who live by the rules usually made it home okay. It's when you tried to do something extra, sometimes because you were trying to help somebody else on the ground, or were trying to show off, or were doing something else stupid. That's when people get hurt. The complex saga of forward air controllers in Vietnam had a relatively simple beginning. In the summer of 1963, a single FAC unit, the 19th Tactical Air Support Squadron, was formed at Ben Hoa Air Base, just outside the South Vietnamese capital of Saigon. The squadron was part of a broader American effort to advise and assist Vietnam in combating communist guerrillas known as the Viet Cong. The FACs were equipped with several Cessna 01s, small, lightweight spotter planes known as bird dogs that carried nothing more than a few radios and four target-marking rockets. Their mission was to train South Vietnamese pilots to perform reconnaissance, mark ground targets, and direct airstrikes in support of government forces on the ground. Initially, the pilots were to remain in country for no more than a year while training was completed. But American forward air controllers remained in Southeast Asia for much longer, and the scope and breadth of their mission expanded dramatically. In the spring of 1965, President Lyndon Johnson began deploying large combat units to Vietnam. The first Marines landed at Da Nang in March. By the end of 1966, more than 385,000 men were stationed throughout the country. As the buildup escalated, American forces began to regularly engage Viet Cong elements in vicious firefights.
To support increased combat involvement, Johnson deployed hundreds of fighter aircraft to South Vietnam throughout 1965 and 66. Their primary mission was to provide close air support for U.S. patrols that came into contact with guerrilla forces. President uh, Johnson decided the uh, commitment to escalate the war in 1966. So the war came from being a Vietnamese war with American support to an American war fought in Vietnam. So with that, with the conventional forces coming into it, so came the air power, the jet fighter bombers. So they found out that here you had 450 knot fighter bombers trying to find targets in a close air support environment with friendly troops and said, how are we going to do this? And this is where the forward air controller really came into his own because he was the go-between between the ground forces and the fighter bombers. Three more tactical air support squadrons were activated by the Air Force in the spring of 65 to keep pace with escalating tensions. Many other facts also began flying for the U.S. Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, and for various South Vietnamese and Australian units. The limited range of the bird dogs forced most of the pilots to operate on their own, from hundreds of rough, unfinished airstrips scattered throughout the country. But the basic components of their missions were largely the same. The number one priority for all facts was responding to emergency calls from troops in contact. Once overhead, the FAC built a mental picture of the situation below by radioing ground commanders and carefully circling in for a closer look. At the same time, he began to search for the best form of available fire support. FACs could control several types of firepower, including helicopter gunships and land and sea-based artillery. But their primary resource was air power, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps fighter bombers that staged from bases in South Vietnam and Thailand, and from carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin and the South China Sea. To request an airstrike, FACS radioed the nearest Direct Air Support Center, or DASC. DASC controllers could launch a flight of alert fighters that were already armed, had their engines running, and often even had their pilots strapped in. Or they could divert a flight that was already airborne. But in especially critical situations, many FACS simply bypassed official command altogether. could have bombs on a target in as little as three minutes, five minutes. I mean, I've had it that, that close. I got in real trouble and I needed it. And I almost, I, well, a couple times I did, I stole the fighters. You know, I knew what their strike frequency was and I got on it and I just stole them from another forward air controller. <laughs> he improvised and said, hey, I got my, my trouble's worse than yours. We'll sort out the paperwork later. It was surprisingly easy for fighter bomber crews to accidentally respond to radio transmissions from one fac while rendezvousing with another, a situation that could lead to disaster. Most facts devised a variety of methods, such as rocking their wings, to visually confirm their identity. The FAC immediately contacted any fighters that responded to determine the number and type of aircraft available, their ordnance load, and the amount of time each man could remain on station. At the same time, they tried to remain in contact with tactical air control personnel and to pinpoint the positions of friendly forces below. So there's the forward air controller with three radios to which we can monitor all three of them at once. We can only transmit on them one at a time. So you're trying to fly the airplane, keep track of what's going on, and then flipping the wafer switch to, to select which radio you were going to transmit on. And you know, sometimes you'll forget to switch it and you're talking to the ground guys and then all of a sudden uh, fighters will come up and you'll forget to switch frequency and, you, and the ground guys get confused. And then, and then uh, the real part of it is starts the adrenaline pumping is when the ground guys get on there and they start saying, uh, 
we're hit, you know, or can you get us out of here? And you hear nothing but hand grenades and automatic weapons. I mean, your radios are just filled with a static uh, of automatic weapons, uh, M60 machine guns, uh, M16 rifles, and you can always pick out the sound of an AK-47. But, you know, when you start hearing the enemy's weapons on your radio, you know you got problems. Facts often asked ground commanders to pop a canister of colored smoke to confirm their location. But the tactic had to be used cautiously, as the smoke also provided better reference for enemy gunners. To make matters worse, the Viet Cong frequently tried to deceive the facts into directing airstrikes against friendly positions. You never wanted to ask the friendlies to pop a particular kind of smoke because if the enemy can hear that and they listen to our radios, then if you say, hey, give me yellow smoke, well, then the enemy pops yellow smoke too. Well, which one is it? So we would ask the friendly forces to pop smoke, and then once they would pop a smoke, we would say, okay, I have your green smoke, and they'd say, Roger, we're the green smoke, so now I know where they are. Once a fact had a comprehensive picture of the situation below, he rolled in to mark targets with white phosphorus rockets known as Willy Peets. This was by far the most hazardous point in a FAC's mission. Once enemy forces realized that a FAC had spotted them, they usually turned their guns on the vulnerable pilot to prevent him from spreading the word. The chance that they would actually find their mark increased dramatically as the pilot dove steadily toward their position and then struggled to climb out of the area. As soon as a FAC had laid down some smoke, he began to brief the fighters on how the strike should proceed, painting a detailed image of the target area, the desired strike headings, and the intensity and location of enemy fire. The fact closely monitored every pass the fighters made, correcting any maneuvers that posed a risk to the friendlies below. They also had to be extremely familiar with the capabilities of different ordnance types, a critical factor in determining just how close bombs could be dropped to friendly positions. When you're working your fighters around friendlies, you keep them under much tighter control. You watch every, every time they roll in. In many cases, if they didn't look right, you would tell them to go through dry. And let's set it up again. Let's do it, let's do it right this time. These types of weapons are extremely destructive. And as an example, with a 500-pound with bomb, a Mark 82, generally you wanted to have your friendlies at least 200 meters away from them because of the concussive blast of that. I mean, it, it'll, it'll take out your eardrums, definitely, when those bombs go off. Other types of ordnance that we would use, like napalm, you know, you're gonna get a splash effect from that, and you don't wanna hit your friendlies with that. We had another weapon that we would use called cluster bomb units, or CBUs, and you would drop a bomb, uh, a big clamshell would open and you'd, you'd have hundreds of little bomblets that would float to the ground and explode over a wide area. Great for blowing up trucks and guns, but real dangerous around people, okay? Nothing was more rewarding for forward air controllers than the response they got from troops that had been saved by close air support. John Flanagan clearly recalls the response he got during one such mission, when an eight-man patrol stumbled upon a much larger Viet Cong force and became pinned down by heavy fire. Flanagan was overhead and in contact with the frantic patrol leader within minutes. 
The guy was obviously uh, very frightened, I mean, because his words ran together, his, his high-pitched tone of his voice, and you go, oh, boy. So here's a case where you've got to take control of the situation and find out where he is, where the fire is coming from, get the fighter bombers on the target, and this one was pretty close. We were working about 50 to 100 meters, uh, some friendlies. And uh, as soon as we put that first can of napalm in there, uh, it just changed. All of a sudden, he comes, yeah, that's great. Go get him. Right on. More, more, more. The timely and accurate support of forward air controllers frequently turned the tide of battle in seconds, saving the lives of countless American and Allied infantrymen. Things did not always go as planned, and many close air support missions ultimately ended in tragedy. But the willingness of facts to risk it all earned them enormous respect from American forces throughout Southeast Asia. Additional aircraft were needed to perform vital forward air control missions as the Vietnam War intensified and expanded. Plans for a faster, more heavily armed plane were initiated in 1964 but the new breed of aircraft wasn't available until 68. An interim solution was found in the Cessna O2 Skymaster, another off-the-shelf civilian plane that was pressed into military service in 1967. The speed of the Skymaster's push-pull engine system allowed Fax to rapidly respond to more distant emergencies and to better survive in high-threat environments. It also carried more marking rockets, a small amount of armor, and a communication and navigation package that enabled distant fighters to quickly determine the fact's exact position. Despite the advantages, the Skymasters would never fully replace the rugged old bird dogs, which continued to operate alongside the O2 for most of the war. Next to supporting troops in contact, the FAC's most important mission was conducting visual reconnaissance. Hundreds of FAC systematically patrolled specific sectors throughout the countryside each day in an attempt to track down the elusive Viet Cong. We would get real familiar with that particular area. That was my area. I knew all the waterfalls, all the trees, all the all the mud puddles and which way the tracks went and where the, where the hooches were in that particular area. I got to know it real well, where the fire bases were. And uh, if we were just going on reconnaissance, we'd go and fly a pattern over that area and look for any instances of change from the last time we, we were there. You know, all of a sudden, the laundry starts turning up on the line uh, in somebody's backyard. And we say, well, wait a minute, that laundry hasn't been there. Well, when you go down, you take a closer look. One look, all right? You don't go back because then they'll have the guns out waiting for you. One look and you say, wow, there's a lot of male pajamas hanging on the line. And you hadn't seen any males in the area. Well, you knew that a Viet Cong unit was transiting the area. Many facts actually dropped down to treetop level to troll for enemy fire when something suspicious caught their eye. During this risky maneuver, the pilot literally tried to lure the Viet Cong into firing on his aircraft so that they would expose their positions. Fax could immediately request a flight of fighter bombers when a major target was uncovered. But most of their reconnaissance was combined with other forms of intelligence to establish targets for pre-planned airstrikes. The pre-planned strike would be requested through the Army channels and it would be from the day before. And it would go through this intricate network, through the Direct Air Support Center to the Tactical Air Control Center in Saigon, and then all the colonels would sit around and they'd, oh, so we're gonna have the big war, and they decide, and they start allocating, because the missions, they call frag, frag orders, uh, had to go back out to the fighter bases, and it would assign the fighters, say, okay, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, you're gonna go to this place, and this fighter mission at 11 o'clock goes here and so on down the line and, and here's the forward air controller and so they match up with the forward air controller and so the strike would good. You know, nice if you got a nice orderly battle, right? You say, okay, you guys are, you know, you Viet Cong, you have to attack at 10 o'clock, right? Because that's when we have our air power. Yeah, okay. There was often nothing of value left in the target area by the time a pre-planned strike could be launched. But frag orders generally required the pilots to carry out the strike 
regardless of what they found when they returned to the area. Dave Albinson clearly remembers the frustration he felt during one such mission, when he decided to closely inspect the target for a pre-planned strike well in advance of the fighter bomber's arrival. I went down and looked, and it was very precise location of a bend in the river. And there was nothing there. There was, there was, there was no hooch. There was no path. There was no evidence of any activity whatsoever. And I called back in. Are you sure this is the location? Yes. Da, 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 da. So the fighters showed up, and I sent him home. I said, we don't have anything here. Have you got a second location for us? No. This is it. This is the only location. I sent him home. Well, I was, you know, when I got home, within two hours, I was in a brace in front of a colonel's desk for second guessing the frag. And uh, it was very clear to me that uh, there were consequences for not going by the book. As the war progressed, many facts concluded that it was going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to combat the Viet Cong's guerrilla tactics with air power. The VC became renowned for their ability to conduct hit and run raids and to melt back into the countryside. Enemy forces were just absolutely tough. Remember, we were fighting on their terrain, in their jungle, uh, their environment. The local Viet Cong knew every trail, knew every, every ambush site, every way station. Uh, everything. So we were at a, you know, very much of a, at a disadvantage. Trying to use air power against small groups of men on the ground who can bury themselves in and escape uh, is, is the wrong tool for the job. That's all there was to it. The Viet Cong became extremely adept at evading U.S. air power but they were equally committed to combating it. They knew that at close range, a single shot could send the pilot of even the most sophisticated strike aircraft to a fiery death. Very determined people. We got into some uh, airstrikes and gunfights down in, uh, near Song Bay, and we kept dropping bombs on them, and they stood down there with impunity and just kept firing right back at us. We put 500-pound bombs on them, they'd line up and open up on the next airplane that came in with their 30 calibers. The low, slow-flying facts were constantly in danger of being struck by what became known as the Golden BB, a single lucky shot that could end a pilot's life without warning. The simple old bird dog could actually withstand a significant amount of battle damage, but its thin skin afforded absolutely no protection for the pilot. A basic flak vest was all they really had, and every pilot quickly learned how best to put it to use. So, you know, if you were on the ground and a Ford, you know, when I was controlling, I'd wear the flak vest, but in the airplane, you didn't wear it, you sat on it. Because if you're going to get hit, it was going to come up through the floor or anything like that. There was no armor plate or anything in the old ones. It's just very thin aluminum. There's nothing in the seat. So we used to put it under the cushion, and we used to sit on our flak vest to get the biggest size possible, believe me. <laughs> Fax often operated in pairs to discourage enemy forces from firing on them and to facilitate rapid recovery if one was shot down. Many developed a weaving flight path where neither their heading nor altitude remained stable long enough for enemy gunners to draw an accurate lead. But the limited capabilities of the bird dogs, and even the more powerful Skymasters, were no match for the increasingly capable and better armed communist forces that emerged throughout the region. Hundreds of facts were shot down, some repeatedly, and at least 219 were ultimately lost in action. FAC operations in Southeast Asia took a gigantic leap forward in 1968 with the introduction of the North American OV-10 Bronco. 
The Bronco was the first aircraft actually designed with FAC missions in mind. It had two powerful engines that allowed pilots to fly at much higher speeds and altitudes, and a unique tandem seating arrangement that afforded exceptional visibility. It was also equipped with cutting-edge instruments that allowed crews to fly at night and in bad weather, with five powerful radios that enabled them to communicate directly with virtually anyone, and with up to 28 marking rockets that dramatically increased the amount of time they could remain airborne before having to rearm. But the most significant improvement was the addition of armor plating and ejection seats, key features that vastly improved the odds that a fact would be able to survive. The Bronco's arrival provided a major boost to FAC operations in country, but its increased capabilities had a far greater impact outside of Vietnam altogether, in another, even more intense battle that had already been raging for several years, the battle to close the notorious Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail became a critical supply line for communist forces operating in South Vietnam. The trail was actually a vast network of old footpaths that ran some 1,700 miles from North Vietnam through Laos and Cambodia to the south. As the war escalated, North Vietnamese troops developed the trail into a complex road network that could handle large convoys of trucks. The network became much more advanced than anyone had anticipated. By 1967, Communist convoys were delivering 60 tons of food, weapons, and ammunition a day to hundreds of small units in the countryside. In the spring of 1965, the U.S. launched a massive interdiction campaign against the trail in an attempt to halt the flow of men and supplies pouring into South Vietnam. By early 66, more than 100 strike sorties were being flown against the trail each day. Initially, reconnaissance and strike control for the campaign were performed by fax flying O-1s and O-2s from Air Force squadrons operating in South Vietnam and from a newly created squadron that was stationed at Nakhon Phanom Air Base in Thailand. But mountainous terrain and increased anti-aircraft fire along the trail began to take a serious toll on FAC operations. The long-awaited arrival of the more capable Bronco significantly boosted both the effectiveness and morale of FACs who fought in the deadly campaign. We would go out every day with, with uh, photographs that we would try to use to, to, to find the trucks. Uh, we had sensors that we had placed all over the trail called Igloo White, and the sensors would relay information back telling us that a certain sensor string in a certain location uh, would hear five or six trucks passing by, and then we would try to find those trucks. And then a lot of times we would just visually find the trucks just through looking through binoculars, you know, looking at the ground. And we used to call it busting trucks. We're going out to bust trucks. The North Vietnamese Army became extremely adept at camouflaging weapons, supply caches, and truck depots. As in South Vietnam, the effectiveness of enemy camouflage forced the facts to search for key indicators rather than for the targets themselves. The North Vietnamese were, were uh, very good, excellent at camouflaging things, but the thing that they never covered was their tracks. And we could tell from the air if tracks were new or old just by the way that they degraded the ground or the grass or something. And I became very adept at being able to follow a series of tracks into an area that was then perfectly camouflaged, and, and I would attack that area and, and blow off the cover, and sure enough, there would be something of value down there. Facts were able to ferret out and direct strikes against thousands of extremely lucrative targets. But such a piecemeal approach appeared to have little impact on the massive flow of men and supplies pouring southward. As a result, many pilots began to develop new interdiction tactics on the fly 
in a desperate attempt to shore up the failing campaign. There was the road itself. We would try to literally break the road. We would bomb it, crater it, and everything so that it was, no, it was not passable, and, and the enemy would come back in very quickly and, and repair the road. And I mean, it was not unusual when we would go on in an airstrike uh, and, and blow huge holes in the road. Literally, as the dust was clearing, the, the enemy troops would be out there with shovels filling in the holes again. There was just no way you could stop them. To make repairs more difficult, Facts often tried to create choke points in areas that were heavily traveled, but that could not be bypassed. We would take a specific place that was hard to repair, and we would just constantly bomb it. And, and uh, same thing, uh, they would be back in opening it very quickly. So we would target their road repair equipment. We would go after bulldozers. We would go after truck graders, stuff like that that we would see down there. In time, many of the pilots concluded that the flood of men and supplies was simply unstoppable. They would float supplies down the rivers. So we would try to you know, observe the rivers and, and watch for supplies moving that way. And then later in the war, they'd even built uh, pipelines down through there to uh, pipe uh, fuel and stuff like that. And we would try to find the pipelines and bust those. And it was just a constant, constant, ongoing battle. As the campaign to close the trail expanded and intensified, so too did North Vietnamese efforts to defend it. More faster firing and larger caliber anti-aircraft weapons began to line major infiltration routes and potential choke points. Forward air controllers faced the greatest risk of being hit by the withering barrages of fire but they still felt a tremendous amount of responsibility for the fighters they controlled. Before a strike commenced, the FAC made sure the crews knew exactly where the nearest divert base was and what they should do if a crisis developed in the target area. We would brief the fighters, hey, if you're hit, go here, try to bail out here. And I would try to show them where that was. I would say, if you need to bail out immediately, go west of the river or go to the high ground to the north, because they may not have much time. If an airplane is damaged, it's on fire, they only have seconds to eject. The mere presence of a forward air controller provided strike crews with a tremendous sense of security. Every pilot knew that if a man did go down, the FAC would do everything in his power to get him out alive. In 1971, a modified version of the Bronco promised to increase both the safety and potency of FAC missions. Fifteen aircraft were modified to carry an internally mounted night sensor, a precision navigation device known as Loran, and a laser target designator. The system, known as Pave Nail, completely revolutionized FAC operations. For years, the North Vietnamese had largely operated on the Ho Chi Minh Trail at night, when the cover of darkness allowed massive convoys to travel with almost complete impunity. The pave nail system allowed crews not only to see moving targets at night, but to actually pinpoint them for destruction with a new generation of laser-guided munitions. This was the beginning, really, of, of a revolution in aerial warfare, if you will, because we began to use precision-guided weapons. And we found, though, that through the use of the laser-guided bombs, we could literally tuck bombs into caves, because what we would do is we would laze the target with our laser guidance, say, about 50 meters short of the target, and the bomb would fall and guide on that position. And we knew about how long it would take for the bomb to fall from the airplane down to the ground. So just a few seconds before impact, we would then move the crosshairs on the laser system up to the mouth of the cave or just above it. And the bomb, of course, would try to follow the guidance and it would literally tuck and go into the mouth of the cave. The addition of the OV-10 and the paved nail system represented the peak of FAC capabilities in Southeast Asia. 
But a small group of elite combat pilots continued to fly the simple old bird dogs in a top secret campaign throughout most of the war. They operated under the call sign, Raven. Their mission was to support indigenous forces in a massive CIA-backed campaign to prevent the North Vietnamese army from invading the kingdom of Laos. The presence of American military personnel in what was known as the Other Theater was officially denied by three separate White House and Pentagon administrations. It was a clandestine program at the time because uh, we were still trying to observe the, quote, neutrality of Laos as dictated under the Geneva Accords in 1962. So when we flew, we flew in civilian clothes, if you will, blue jeans and this type of stuff. And we were supposed to maintain some kind of a coverage that we were, in fact, up there working for the forestry agency or something like that. In, in fact, though, we were assigned to the embassy in Vientiane, and we worked directly with the various commanders throughout Laos. Only the most accomplished and daring facts were invited to take part in the Ravens' covert campaign. The pilots largely operated on their own, conducting every type of fact mission imaginable, from dozens of extremely rough remote airstrips located throughout Laos. Up there, we could end up doing anything, literally, on a moment's notice. We would, one mission, we would be working troops in contact, closer support with them. Another mission, we'd be out long range, we'd be busting trucks, doing regular interdiction, uh, or going up and supporting a, uh, uh, an outpost that had been surrounded by bad guys. Occasionally, we'd be up talking to long range ground teams that were out watching the trails, doing stuff like that. So uh, you, you never knew what you were going to be doing day to day. And some days, we'd just be out looking for targets. There's not much going on. And in other days, we'd be in the thick of a, of a huge battle. American airmen had to abide by increasingly complex and at times incomprehensible rules of engagement as the war in Southeast Asia progressed. The Ravens also were supposed to abide by specific rules governing air combat in Laos. But in reality, they operated with almost complete autonomy. When I was up as a Raven, uh, we were the rules of engagement. I remember one day in particular, uh, there was a new guy up working northeast of me, and he tried to put in an airstrike, and he obviously did not know what he was doing or where he was, and was not following the proper procedure. So I just came up on the radio and I said, this is Raven 2-5, this is my sandbox. You will not drop, acknowledge. And they didn't drop, because it wasn't clear where they were, what they were bombing, or what they were doing. And so there was always that risk of, of killing friendlies or, you know, or in, in some cases just indigenous people that were friendly to us that we just wanted to try to leave alone. Few statistics were kept on the Ravens' clandestine operations, but it is clear that they suffered one of the highest loss rates of the entire conflict. Some have speculated that nearly half of the pilots never made it home. The close bonds the pilots formed with Laotian ground forces contributed to the problem. The Ravens lived and worked closely with these men and were willing to take enormous risks to come to their aid. I knew these people, I knew who they were, and, and, and uh, some of them, after Laos fell to the communists, made it to the United States, and, and you know we had formed some friendships based on all of that, but it became very personal sometimes working with these guys, and a lot of times if the weather was bad and the fighters couldn't get in to work with us, I'd take off and instead of carrying smoke rockets on my O-1, I'd carry uh, high explosive rounds. I'd take high, eight high explosive rounds and I would go out and I would be my own fighter aircraft. Close air support remained the most important mission for every FAC who served in Southeast Asia. Whether he took part in the covert war in Laos, flew missions against the trail, or worked in South Vietnam itself. And at no time were these missions more personal, more rewarding, and potentially more heartbreaking than when the FAC had established close ties with the very men he was trying to help. No one is more aware of this fact than John Flanagan. He lived with and regularly supported the same small reconnaissance patrols from Project Delta day after day. And he will never be able to forget the terrible chain of events that took shape on December 2nd, 1966. 
Two days earlier, a six-man team from the elite Special Forces unit had been mistakenly inserted into Laos. The patrol had already come into contact with North Vietnamese regulars. Three of the men were wounded, one seriously. Flanagan was called out to help locate the men and to coordinate a last-ditch recovery effort. The weather was deteriorating and no fighter support was available. To make matters worse, the helicopters were running dangerously low on fuel. A critical but fateful decision had to be made. I had to expedite things and I probably made a tactical mistake and I, I asked the team to throw smoke and so because we needed to get the helicopters in there fast and they dropped the smoke and, and I had gone over the team before that. No ground fire, absolutely no ground fire. I looked right down at them, I was at about 50 feet. Saw their face, they kind of waved, and uh, nobody shot at me. Absolutely no one. It was just, I looked around, I said, oh, okay. I don't see anybody. And, and then, so then they brought the rescue, the pickup helicopter in. And the North Vietnamese, they waited, well-disciplined troops. They waited until the helicopter just got into the hover, and they opened up. And it was an ambush. They had sucked the helicopter in an ambush, and they started transmitting on, on the radio, we're taking fire, we're taking fire. And I could hear the slugs from the AK-47s. I could hear them hitting the airplane, the, the helicopter. You could hear them going through the metal. And then they, you hear the uh, door gunners with their M60 machine guns firing back, hammering back. And I got on the radio, and I said, get out of there, get out of there. And the helicopter started to lift off, climbed them at 300 feet, and then just nosed over and plunged into the jungle in a big fireball. There was four Americans, the helicopter crew, plus the Special Forces medic that was on board that just perished right there. In the meantime, the uh, team on the ground, they said, in fact, please help us, we're hurt bad. So I went in there making like it was I was going to have an airstrike, firing rockets, throwing stuff out the window to try and disc track the North Vietnamese to think that there was an airstrike coming because they'd run and hide. I started firing the rockets in there and I couldn't even get my rockets to go off because I was so close that the rockets didn't go far enough to arm. So I had nothing but a, a high-speed spear. So I withdrew to try and see, you know, what could I do? I called Hillsboro, which was the uh, Air Force Command uh, C-130 that was over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They were up around 15, 18,000 feet. And I said, Hillsboro, I need some A-1s fast. I got to get, I got, I got people that are dying and we're going to lose them. And they said, sorry, we don't have anything. There's nothing flying. We just can't get them in. And so that's the tragedy. Like I, I mean, I knew it was over then. The tears just rolled out my face. And I said, God, I don't you know. So I flew back over to where the team had been. I looked down, and uh, nobody shot at us. I was surprised. But there was no equipment there. There was just trampled grass, no bodies, nothing. Forward air controllers played a critical role in the war in Southeast Asia from the beginning until the bitter end. In fact, much of the massive multifaceted American campaign would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible, without their most unusual and daring form of support. The fact that two of the 12 Air Force Medal of Honor recipients in Vietnam were facts attests to the skill and courage needed to perform their incredible missions. The facts were a step in the appropriate direction in trying to bring air power to bear where it could be effective. But still, in a jungle environment where it's easy to mask your moves and easy to hide, it's very difficult, even with a slow-moving aircraft like an O-1 or an O-2 or an OV-10, to accurately identify, pinpoint, and bring air power to bear on a ground target. The facts have never enjoyed the same recognition and glamour as the pilots of fast and powerful fighter bombers. But their missions are dignified by the tremendous amount of risk that they faced each day, and by the admiration of thousands of pilots and infantrymen who may never have made it home alive without their support.
controllers remained in Southeast Asia for much longer, and the scope and breadth of their mission expanded dramatically. In the spring of 1965, President Lyndon Johnson began deploying large combat units to Vietnam. The first Marines landed at Da Nang in March. By the end of 1966, more than 385,000 men were stationed throughout the country. As the buildup escalated, American forces began to regularly engage Viet Cong elements in vicious firefights. To support increased combat involvement, Johnson deployed hundreds of fighter aircraft to South Vietnam throughout 1965 and 66. Their primary mission was to provide close air support for U.S. patrols that came into contact with guerrilla forces. President uh, Johnson decided uh, commitment to escalate the war in 1966. So the war came from being a Vietnamese war with American support to an American war fought in Vietnam. So with that, with the conventional forces coming into it, so came the air power, the jet fighter bombers. So they found out that here you had 450 knot fighter bombers trying to find targets in a close air support environment with friendly troops and said, how are we going to do this? And this is where the forward air controller really came into his own because he was the go-between between the ground forces and the fighter bombers. Three more tactical air support squadrons were activated by the Air Force in the spring of 65 to keep pace with escalating tensions. Many other facts also began flying for the U.S. Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, and for various South Vietnamese and Australian units. The limited range of the bird dogs forced most of the pilots to operate on their own, from hundreds of rough, unfinished airstrips scattered throughout the country. But the basic components of their missions were largely the same. The number one priority for all facts was responding to emergency calls from troops in contact. Once overhead, the FAC built a mental picture of the situation below by radioing ground commanders and carefully circling in for a closer look. At the same time, he began to search for the best form of available fire support. FACs could control several types of firepower, including helicopter gunships and land and sea-based artillery. But their primary resource was air power. Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps fighter bombers that staged from bases in back and I got on the radio and I said, get out of there, get out of there. Such desperate situations drove Flanagan and many other FACs to risk everything. They knew they were the lifeline, the last ray of hope for panic-stricken men on the ground. But so did the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese. And when it became clear that the pilots of these strange little planes were much more than just casual observers, the slow-flying facts became a prime target. Pilots took every precaution they could to survive. Most routinely radioed ground units with the hope that if they were shot down, someone would be able to reach them before it was too late. Others packed a small arsenal of weapons, just in case they had to shoot their way out. But these measures ultimately did little to reduce the dismal loss rates that facts suffered in Vietnam. Typically, uh, they went out and were never heard from again, or went out and got hit and went down, and we knew where they went down, but it was such a hot area, by the time we got there, uh, they were dead. People who live by the rules usually made it home okay. It's when you tried to do something extra, sometimes because you were trying to help somebody else on the ground, or were trying to show off, or were doing something else stupid, that's when people get hurt. The complex saga of forward air controllers in Vietnam 
had a relatively simple beginning. In the summer of 1963, a single FAC unit, the 19th Tactical Air Support Squadron, was formed at Ben Hoa Air Base just outside the South Vietnamese capital of Saigon. The squadron was part of a broader American effort to advise and assist Vietnam in combating communist guerrillas known as the Viet Cong. The FACs were equipped with several Cessna 01s, small, lightweight spotter planes known as bird dogs that carried nothing more than a few radios and four target-marking rockets. Their mission was to train South Vietnamese pilots to perform reconnaissance, mark ground targets, and direct airstrikes in support of government forces on the ground. Initially, the pilots were to remain in country for no more than a year while training was completed. But American forward air control in South Vietnam and Thailand, and from carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin and the South China Sea. To request an airstrike, FAX radioed the nearest direct air support center, or DASC. DASC controllers could launch a flight of alert fighters that were already armed, had their engines running, and often even had their pilots strapped in. Or they could divert a flight that was already airborne. But in especially critical situations, many FAX simply bypassed official command altogether. You could have bombs on a target in as little as three minutes, five minutes. I mean, I've had it that, that close. I got in a real trouble and I needed it. And I almost, I, well, a couple times I did, I stole the fighters. You know, I knew what their strike frequency was and I got on it and I just stole them from another forward air controller. I mean, he improvised and said, hey, I got my, my trouble's worse than yours. We'll sort out the paperwork later. It was surprisingly easy for fighter bomber crews to accidentally respond to radio transmissions from one FAC while rendezvousing with another, a situation that could lead to disaster. Most FACs devised a variety of methods, such as rocking their wings to visually confirm their identity. The FAC immediately contacted any fighters that responded to determine the number and type of aircraft available, their ordnance load, and the amount of time each man could remain on station. At the same time, they tried to remain in contact with tactical air control personnel and to pinpoint the positions of friendly forces below. So there's the forward air controller with three radios to which we can monitor all three of them at once. We could only transmit on them one at a time. So you're trying to fly the airplane, keep track of what's going on, and then flipping the wafer switch to, to select which radio you were going to transmit on. And you know, sometimes you'll forget to switch it and you're talking to the ground guys and then all of a sudden uh, fighters will come up and you'll forget to switch frequency and, you, and the ground guys get confused. And then, and then uh, the real part of it starts the adrenaline pumping is when the ground guys get on there and they start saying, uh, we're hit, you know, or can you get us out of here? And you hear nothing but hand grenades and automatic weapons. I mean, your radios are just filled with a static uh, of automatic weapons, uh, M60 machine guns, uh, M16 rifles, and you can always pick out the sound of an AK-47. But you know, when you start hearing the enemy's weapons on your radio, you know you got problems. Fax often asked ground commanders to pop a canister of colored smoke to confirm their location. But the tactic had to be. American fighter pilots found it extremely difficult to distinguish between friend and foe in the jungles and rice paddies of Vietnam. To cut through the fog of war, hundreds of facts scoured the countryside in lightweight, unarmed aircraft, pinpointing enemy positions with target marking rockets and directing follow-on airstrikes. The facts never attracted as much attention as the pilots of fast and powerful fighter bombers. But much of the massive air war in Southeast Asia would have been impossible 
without their daring support. Few air combat missions could be as dangerous, demanding, and potentially heartbreaking as the missions of forward air controllers in Vietnam. The ability of fighter-bomber crews to independently provide close air support proved to be extremely difficult. Firefights often broke out at close range between small American patrols that became intermingled with the elusive Viet Cong beneath dense, triple canopy jungle. The FAX mission was to quickly make sense of the situation from above and to call in airstrikes in support of the men below, a job he had to do with nothing more than a few radios, a few target-marking rockets, and a lot of guts. I can only describe it as, as sheer chaos. And it usually, when the forward air controller got called when everything was going, was going steadily downhill, the Army would try and control what they're doing with their command and control helicopters, and then when they get into it and they just find out, oh, there's too much in here, we need heavier firepower, they can't handle it with the gunships, or they can't handle it with artillery, or they just can't find the friendlies. That was the biggest problem was in the jungle, under the jungles. Nobody knew where anybody was. Remember, we, we didn't have uh, satellites and, and GPS, global positioning systems, or anything like that. You know, this was technology. This was reading a map and locating somebody on the map. And the maps were old. Uh, a lot of the maps we used were from the French. The pressure was enormous. Time was of the essence. But every decision a fact made could have meant the difference between life and death for men on the ground. The experience of the fighter-bomber crews, the capabilities of their aircraft and ordnance, and the exact positions of friendlies were just a few of the factors that had to be considered before a strike could be called in. To make matters worse, facts often had to immediately weigh the risk of over-responding to frantic calls for help against the risk of losing men because of their own inaction. Sometimes they wouldn't tell you how close it was. They would just say, bomb the target because they were in such dire straits that they needed air support and they needed it now. So you would ask them, you know, how close is this to you? They would say, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. Just put the bombs down. Fax performed several critical missions in Vietnam, but none were more important to the pilots than close air support. Many not only knew the troops they supported, they actually became close friends with them. The bonds formed with members of U.S. Special Forces teams were especially intense. Facts assigned to these elite units lived with and regularly assisted the same small reconnaissance patrols day after day. John Flanagan fact for Project Delta, a unit that routinely inserted small teams into extremely hostile areas to spy on enemy activity. I knew them all by first name. I could recognize them. So their voices over the radio. You know, I'd know who they were. Although we used, you know, official call signs, but I, you know, I had a beer with this guy. I knew his wife. I knew his children. I knew his girlfriend. I knew, you know, everything where he was from. So it became a very, very personal uh, type of war. Facts were terrified of losing the men they were assigned to support. They had a front row seat above the action and would do everything in their power to prevent such a haunting scenario. But their unique role routinely propelled them straight to the heart of some of the worst situations imaginable. No one is more aware of this fact than John Flanagan. On December 2nd, 1966, he was called out to assist a last ditch effort to recover a Delta team that had accidentally been inserted into Laos. No fighter support was available, but when Flanagan finally pinpointed the team's position, 
the situation appeared secure enough for one of Delta's helicopters to attempt a rapid pickup. The North Vietnamese, they waited well-disciplined troops. They waited until the helicopter just got into the hover, and they opened up. And it was an ambush. They had sucked the helicopter in an ambush, and they started transmitting on the radio, and we're taking fire, we're taking fire. And I could hear the slugs from the AK-47s. I could hear them hitting the helicopter. You could hear them going through the metal. And then you hear the uh, door gunners with their M-60 machine guns firing back, hammering.